Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to see you. Welcome to China Exchange. Uh, we are here for one of our regular editions of 60 Minutes With. But before I go into that, if I could just give you some housekeeping rules. Um, toilets are over there, and the fire escape is over there, the green badge. And anyone who wants to take a shortcut, there's the window. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. If I could just very briefly introduce myself, I'm Peng Wen Lan. Um, I'm an independent uh, documentary filmmaker, and I'm also currently leading a heritage project on the Chinese Labour Corps for the Meridian Society. But more importantly, I have a really excellent guest um, who I'm, I know you're all dying to meet tonight, and this is Professor Rana Mitter. Rana is Professor of uh, Modern History and Politics uh, uh, of Modern China, I beg your pardon, at uh, St. Cross College, Oxford, where he is also director of the China Center. And he's written numerous books and articles um, about uh, Republican China and modern China, all of which have received heaps of awards and, and have been highly um, praised by, by all. So, we're going to talk about various things uh, of interest to Rana this evening, but we, I'll start off by asking a few questions and then I'll throw it to the floor. But first of all, could I please ask all of you to warmly welcome Rana Mitter. Okay, now, you may, I'm sure all of you are aware that Rana has recently run a series of radio programs on BBC Radio 4 called Chinese Characters, where he, well, perhaps I can ask Rana what you were trying to do. 20 characters in all, and I use the word characters very loosely because, of course, one of them was a TV program, and the other one was Factory Girls, with a big label. So, what were you trying to achieve with your 20 characters? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Wenlan. Thank you, first of all, for hosting this evening. Thanks for China Exchange for having me here, and thank you to all of you for coming along this evening. Chinese characters was a chance to do something which I think is severely lacking in the British public sphere. In some ways, Britain, I think, is a country which does have a very good, very deep consciousness of the fact that it sits as a small island in a very big world. But I have to say that sometimes I feel that China, and actually the very strong British connection with China, is something that isn't very well understood in the wider world. So when the BBC, when Radio 4 came along with the possibility of doing this series, in what I have to say, bowing down to the greater ones who are before us, what I like to call the Neil McGregor slot. Basically, the former director of the British Museum usually has that spot at 1.45 in the afternoon between the world at one and the archers, which for Radio 4 listeners, you will know is the sacred spot. But on occasions when Neil is allowed to go off and uh, take a well-deserved rest, a few of the rest of us are allowed to sneak into the slot and, and do something else. And the idea of trying to say something about the wider spread and importance of the history of China struck me as a really irresistible opportunity. But you're right that when this idea of Chinese characters came up, and obviously you'll have to forgive the, the dreadful pun, obviously, in the title, but it does seem to have gone down quite, quite effectively. Um, from the very beginning, I thought that, on the one hand, that let it be personality-based. And I, I did very much think that using that idea of people, of people with real lives, real trajectories through what they did and being able to use that to try and explain wider points was very important. But as you said, not all of those characters ended up being single individual humans. Some of them were entities, television program in one case, uh, a group, a class of people, young women in factories in the early 20th century. And of course, couples as well. One of my favorite quite early on was the idea of uh, the people I talked about as Asia's first power couple, Chiang Kai-shek, and Madame Chiang Kai-shek, Sung Mei Ling, the kind of two who I actually think need to be regarded as a dynamic duo rather than necessarily being taken individually. So I took the idea but also wanted to play with it. But the overall message, the overall idea was a very clear one. This is a culture and a society that matters tremendously now, but also has mattered over the thousands of years of Chinese history that have existed. And trying to get some picture of why it matters was really the aim but squeezed into these convenient 14-minute packages. But that's the point. You say thousands of years of Chinese history. How do you whittle it down to 20 people? With, 20 great, with great difficulty is the answer. 
Well, I did have some help along the way. I have to, at this point, put a big acknowledgement to one of the graduate students at Oxford, Elizabeth Smith Rosser, who actually acted as intern and researcher on the program, and I'm glad to say was, was credited also by, by Radio 4 for this, along with the wonderful production team, Ben Crichton and uh, Hugh Levinson and, and others. So we did all make it a kind of collective enterprise, but in a sense, I had to be given you know, rather frighteningly kind of uh, my head in terms of deciding what would go in there in the end. And there were a lot of things I wanted to balance. I think what I did was to start with some ideas about China, things that I wanted to say overall for anyone who was kind, stroke, mad enough to listen to all 20 of them, either in quick succession or over time. So one idea, and what I wanted to do was also try and bust some myths about China, break down some ideas about China that perhaps are received wisdom that we need to get behind. So one idea is the idea that I've really been pushing back against, I hope, in all my writings, that China's a very enclosed place. It's got great walls around it. Nobody can ever get into China. And actually, one of the things that strikes me over time is that China's distinctive character, again, if I use that phrase, has been about actually an openness to the outside world. That could be in a whole variety of areas like um, culture. Confucianism, of course, coming from within China's indigenous traditions. Buddhism coming from India, but becoming thoroughly Chinese within a, sh a short period of time. Or in terms of ideas, you can argue that um, a whole variety of Chinese thinkers, uh, you know, great philosophers, um, uh, and, uh, and writers Lu Xun, Ding Ling, and others have obviously shaped modern Chinese culture. But actually, of course, some of the people who have been behind that have been Western thinkers, not least Karl Marx, of course, famously, uh, famously, uh, uh, um, uh, famously in the 20th uh, century. So some of these ideas about China and these received pieces of wisdom, I wanted to get behind. And in a sense, the characters flowed from that. That was one of the reasons that when the program was broadcast, I wanted to make sure that it was not done in chronological order. I thought, in a sense, that was going to be almost the most deadly way of doing it. You know, first this ancient figure, then another ancient figure that people haven't heard of. In other words, starting with actually a figure that I've always perhaps will talk more about, a really fascinating figure, Wu Zetian, China's only female emperor back in the Tang Dynasty. Really interesting, powerful figure. And then immediately after that, Chiang Kai-shek and Song Mei Ling. And for those who know a little bit about Chinese history, you can see a question of power runs through both of those people a thousand years apart, but asking and answering in some ways similar question. One other thing as part of that, not on any grounds of political correctness, but simply on the grounds of showing the full sweep, I was really pleased to be able to bring a very large number of Chinese women into ah, that story. I was going to ask Okay, about that. well, I'll just make that point and we could pick it up. But I think across the spread of Chinese history, it is something that often, particularly when we do the sort of great man type history, mm. that tends to be covered over. So if that's one more myth that I could say I was trying to bust, the idea that Chinese history, like any other history, was only made by men, I hope that would be blown out of the water well, by the end well, of the series. Well, let's talk about Chinese women. You have 20 characters altogether. You have three women, four women. Now, four out of 20. Uh, what, when you consider that Mao Zedong said women hold up half the sky, you know, why only four out of 20? That was, I, four, that was four women in the first week, actually. <laughs> we ended up actually a, a third of them were women. Um, well, so yes, you I do you want to count them off for you? Chinese was it, was it, factory girls. Oh, yeah, but, but so was that an afterthought and you thought, oh, I've only got four out of 20. So I'll just bung in all those factory girls and that'll address the imbalance. Good question, but a simple answer. No, absolutely not. In fact, the factory girls were the ones I thought of earliest on. And actually, that gets to the point of how to do this. I mean, first of all, I would push back at you against, uh, uh, against you in terms of individual names, because off the top of my head, I can think of more than uh, four. I mean, Su Mei Ling, you count as 0.5 if you want to <laughs> yes. with Chiang Kai-shek, but also uh, Ding Ling, Wu Zetian, Wu Zetian um, uh, Tzu Xi, uh, of course, as part of that, uh, uh, part of that too. And I should have to go over the whole, uh, um, the whole list um, uh, again, but certainly more than that across, um, uh, across, uh, across oh, Li Qingzhao, the poet, oh. absolutely. Yep, so. One uh, more. Uh, okay. I'll think of more. But I think of the, um, of the uh, 20, I think six or seven actually had at least some female protagonist in them. And what it pointed out was that, and the factory girls again, I would say, the, the young women who worked in the Shanghai factories. The point is that if you just go for individuals in and of themselves, you will find yourself very quickly falling back on the great man theory. And that's one of the reasons why I thought it was very important to go beyond simply taking individuals and actually take 
classes of people as well. So the point about the factory girls, for those who don't know, these are the young women, often in the, nothing more than girls in some cases, in their teens, who moved in their hundreds and indeed thousands in the early 20th century to the factories of Shanghai, the cotton mills, the silk villages, where they were basically the power force, the labor force behind the Industrial Revolution of the early 20th century. Now, it wouldn't really have been easily possible to do an entire episode about one of those, simply because most of them are not people we have huge numbers of records of. And for the most part, they had in some ways quite similar lives. They came from the countryside. They worked in the factories. Many of them tragically died very young because they were built, uh, breathing in um, cotton fibers and silk fibers that gave them uh, lung diseases. But they also became essentially the backbone of a very important shift, the idea that China would develop this industrialized workforce. And at the end of the episode, I pointed out that actually the last 25 to 30 years have been very similar in certain ways, because of course, China's second export boom in the 80s and 90s was also in large part built off the back of young women working in, uh, in factories. So in that sense, I'd say that actually it was an active attempt, I hope it's a successful one, to try and find ways to bring women's stories as well as men's without having to necessarily fall back on the idea that if there isn't one single famous person, then actually it's not going to be possible to tell the, uh, tell the story. You have to look beyond that and find different ways to, uh, to do it. Mm. Okay, so uh, talking about another minority, mm. if, if I may, you had, oh, I mean, interestingly, three non-Chinese in here. Matteo yep. Ricci, uh, and you had Kublai Khan, if, I Yep. Yeah. And um, who else? Robert Hart, mm -hmm. uh, who was head of customs. What made you even consider non-Chinese, given that obviously you have only 20, yeah. you could have actually put in many more Chinese. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have yeah, yeah. foreigners, but, but, but why not? Well, yeah. yeah, absolutely. It was yet again an attempt to show that the story of China is not just about China, and that understanding what Chinese culture is, is also understanding China's interaction with the wider world. So let's take one particular figure out of those you know, non-Chinese born, non-ethnic Chinese people. And that's actually someone from this country, Sir Robert Hart, who was the first inspector general of the Chinese Maritime Customs, this immensely important economic organization that really did a lot to stabilize and develop China's tax collection facilities in the late 19th and early 20th century. Now, part of what I've just said explains why I thought it was a good idea to do that. Because if I'd said, I'm going to do a 15 minute section on taxation policy in late 19th century China, you might not find that people were running to turn on the radio at that particular point. So bringing some way of bringing that through a personality struck me as important. But Robert Hart struck me as a very important character in a sense, again, to, to give a wider message or tell a lesson, which is this. He was born in Belfast, grew up in Ireland, and then shipped out to join the colonial service and then switched over to the Maritime Customs in the late 19th century. And over the course of nearly half a century running those Maritime Customs, which is longer on the throne than some emperors, I have to say, and in some ways he was a sort of emperor of his own um, domain, he became very, very much self-identified with being a servant of the Chinese government. When asked, he would always say he worked for China, not at all for the British Empire. And indeed was rewarded with uh, um, decorations from the Chinese government when he retired, as well as um, from, the, uh, from the British. This became so much so the case that the, um, uh, uh, a famous uh, uh, late Victorian British news magazine showed a cartoon of him wearing a sort of silk green Chinese robe with just the caption, Chinese custom. But the point was that he regarded himself very much as being someone who was able both to come in from the outside and to play a significant role in China itself. And what I wanted to say with that is that there's an ambiguity about it in which what he says is true, but also one needs to actually question it. The truth of it is that I think he genuinely did believe that and I think there's a lot to be said for his role in helping to shape actually the whole fiscal structure of late 19th century, early 20th century China. But it's also true in a way that he really underplayed that his presence there was also a product of British imperialism in China, of the opium wars, of the violence with gunboats and opium that opened up China. And both of these things are true at the same time. Without British colonial violence, Robert Hart would not have been there. But he also 
carried out a career that had significant benefits for China at the same time. And that puts us in one of those kind of difficult situations where it's not simply black and white or even you know, green silk robes versus uh, uh, black silk robes. It, it is the ambiguities that sit within any one particular person. And that struck me as a very important story about China that needed to be told in that context. Mm. Now, as uh, bo both of us do actually work in the broadcasting industry, mm. very often when we do a series of things, we always try to think about the positioning of each character or, or each program in yeah. or each episode. Uh, and it's really important to have a really big beginner and a big end, someone who really gives a big oomph to the end. Yeah. You chose Deng Xiaoping as yeah. your last one. Why was that? Was it because you felt that his policies were just going to have such far-reaching consequences, mm. good or bad, mm. you know, for China, that you left it yep. at that, or, or why in particular? Given that you weren't yep. uh, uh, following any particular chronological order. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, there was one very um, specific reason which I found, uh, which is, is, is small-scale but enjoyable, which is this. The very last words of the series were actually recorded, as I think I said, in the cable car over Lantau Island, which any of you have never, uh, ever, never been, I One recommend thing. it. It's a fantastic ride. But it also meant that I got an excuse to ride the cable car while recording the program. And of course, Hong Kong, in some sense now, and Lantau Island as part of it, is a product of one of Deng Xiaoping's most important policies, which was the uh, negotiation of the handover. So that was one very specific reason. I thought it would be a nice thing to end the series sort of hanging many thousands of feet above the air in, in a cable car. The wider reason, though, is something that I think is important about perspective, which is it's a series on Chinese history. And although some of us of a certain age may not want to admit it, actually, Deng Xiaoping is now part of history as well. He died more than 20 years ago. For many younger people, he would be someone they might know of in a, in a history book or a, um, a, a news item, but not someone who's part of present-day life, present-day current affairs. And in that sense, I wanted to sort of put a cut-off at that point, because in a sense, the end of Deng Xiaoping's period in 1997 was the end of a whole variety of things that had come to fruition through the 20th century, whether it was, you know, one case, the regaining of Hong Kong, but also the stimulation of what would in the end become the big final story of the 20th century, the economic boom. So in one sense, it provided a sort of capstone to that longer trajectory of Chinese history, but it also gave a little sort of nod, a little signal to what comes after, which is perhaps more current affairs than history. But that, of course, is the business of a different sort of series from this one. Okay, well now, I'm going to do the BBC4 Desert Island Discs thing Ooh. and ask you to choose one character out of those 20. Um, Your favorite. Yep. I will say, I'll give you one favorite, but then if I'm allowed to do one supplement to that as well, then I might well, uh, uh, well do that uh, uh, also, if I may. Okay. I found myself actually thinking that the Asian power couple, Chiang Kai-shek and Sung Mei Ling, were one that I really ended up enjoying doing. One, because actually it was one of the ones that relates most directly to the research I do, which has uh, most recently been on the World War II period in China, mm. but also because it enabled me, I think, again, to sort of overturn a kind of conventional wisdom. If there's any perception of these two in the West these days, and frankly, there's not much anymore. They used to be very famous 50, 70 years ago, not, not so much now. But if there is a perception, it's this rather sort of second-rate, corrupt, not terribly interesting, rather venal characters. You know, Chiang Kai-shek was famous perhaps in that model for incompetence and his wife agreed. And actually, being able to tell a story about them, particularly about their role at the head of wartime China, at a time when, of course, China was a wartime ally of the United States and the British Empire, just told a very different story about them. And they both have very, very distinctive personalities as well. So, you know, one of them spoke hardly any English, very much a kind of figure who came out of a particular sort of Chinese semi-rural background. Another one, another sort of also very typical sort of Chinese, you know, cosmopolitan, internationalized, fluent English speaker, but also very much Chinese. And those are both China as well. So I think that packed a lot into one particular episode. The um, supplement I will give you, if I, uh, uh, if I may, um, would be, though, for actually the character who I wouldn't call my favorite, in fact, almost not, but someone who, in a sense, from that same period, is pulled out of almost a black hole of history. And that's a man called 
Wang Jingwei, who some of you may know as, in as much as he's famous in China at all, it's a sort of the greatest traitor of the 20th century, the man who was basically the equivalent of Pétain or Laval in France, the man who collaborated with the Japanese during World War II. He is not someone who's much talked about in China. Everyone knows who he is, at least by name, but very few people kind of delve into his history. And trying to recover his history and just talk about why he did what he did, not by justifying it, but by explaining it, struck me as a kind of historical explanation, which was a real challenge, and an interesting challenge to do in the context of a 15-minute radio program. So while I wouldn't say he was my favorite character, he was certainly one of the most interesting ones to actually construct a narrative about. Well, I suppose it's just as well you didn't choose Feng Xiaoping to go with you to the Old Desert Island, otherwise it might be changed, it made, made into the next province of China, you know, the big <laughs> metropolis. Okay, well, one thing that you said consistently through your programs mm. was the fact that China seemed to be very open to foreign thoughts and foreign influences and you know, foreign communications with, with the West. Yep. Do you think that that is still the case now? Because, obviously, you know, we've seen yeah. a lot of uh, transitioning. Yeah. Um, well, I'd say, first of all, not just the West. Uh, one of the stories of communication uh, that I wanted to tell very early on was about a character called uh, Kumarajiva, who, again, was brilliantly researched, particularly by Elizabeth Smith Rosser, our um, grad student and, and an intern who uh, knew a lot about him. Because, of course, that was about Buddhism being translated into Chinese characters uh, from the original Sanskrit and Pali text. So an early example of that kind of cross-cultural interaction long before the West, in the classic sense, had, had any role in, uh, in China. But in terms of how it operates now, I think we are currently in a moment of huge ambiguity. Because on the one hand, China has never been more exposed to the West, really with the possible exception perhaps of the early 20th century, in terms of tens of thousands of Chinese students in this country, the UK alone, every year starting degrees and studying uh, here and bringing you know, very welcome interaction. Chinese foreign direct investment around the world, um, you know, huge numbers of trillions of, of, of dollars really, uh, at least in, in intention, being spent around the world uh, in terms of financial influence. Uh, Chinese presence in international organizations, finance, diplomacy, and so forth. So there is that, that very, very major interaction with the outside world. And yet, at the moment, there is a sense that in the last few years there has been a sort of hardening, particularly in the intellectual and academic communities. Um, there's a sense that China is currently, and here I'm talking about in intellectual communities in particular, in some ways feeling more closed off from the outside world. Contrast might be with the 1980s, a time when at that period there was a tremendously wide, often sort of kind of, kind of often quite ramshackle or perhaps not quite wide, but haphazard interaction with the outside world. That was a time when economists, everyone from the kind of ultra-free marketeer Milton Friedman to people from the former Eastern Europe would be invited to give economic advice to China and, you know, everything, everything goes. There is more of a sense, I think, now that people are being pushed into boxes, you know, discussion about historical nihilism in which certain things are off limits uh, and, and can't be talked about. And often it is Western influence. And again, I think there's no secret in this because many public statements by leaders in the last few years have been about the need to kind of clamp down on too much of that Western influence. And I think both China and the West have generally been at their best when both sides have been in very, very open and extensive dialogue with each other. So I, for one, would hope that that dialogue expands rather than contracting, as in some ways it seems in danger of being on both sides. I would say that also there are elements of Western conversation sometimes, particularly the kind of overblown fear of the rise of China, which I think can be overwritten as well. So both sides have some work to do on that, but it does have to come from both sides, I think. But, but don't you think that China is, does suffer from this contrast all the time? You know, it always goes from left to right to extremes when at one period it will embrace ideas from the outside and then mm. you know when things start going wrong they'll all of a sudden clamp down and become very introverted very introspective and then all of a sudden they decide to break out again so what has that done for china i mean you're you're a specialist on republican china that particularly i would say is a time when people were wondering about their identity what is it to be chinese and how can we go about maintaining our chineseness but also trying to get the best from outside 
I think the Republican period in the early 20th century, and most of you will know this, but just a reminder, from 1912 to 1949 on the, the mainland at least, was in a sense one of the most traumatic periods in terms of engagement with the outside world. Because it was, of course, the, the reason that it was a republic is that the 2,000 years of the old imperial rule finally came to an end with the abdication of the last emperor, boy emperor, of course, aged five at that time, and the collapse of uh, a way of thinking and being that in some form had existed for the best part of 2,000 years. So comparatively speaking, that was a really very major transition. And a large part of what people talked and thought about in the Republic was how China would cope with transitioning to a world in which it sat as a nation state amongst others. It then, of course, had added on its shoulders the problems of being a weak country that in some ways was a victim of the imperial powers of Britain, France, United States, and others who were keen to try and prevent it from having full sovereignty. So in a sense, the political crisis of the Republic was a much, much more serious one than anything we see now. China today is a country which you know, clearly has very strong borders, strong military, strong economy, all of that. And therefore, I think in some senses, there is an overwritten, overblown sense of crisis at the moment. There are problems, not least with the economy, that will no doubt have to be sorted yeah. out. But the sense that there's any kind of existential crisis, um, I mean, the Republican period, of course, ended with the war with Japan, probably one of the single most, the single most devastating event in China in the early 20th, uh, 20th century. So in that sense, I think that there has been probably this sense of trying to move towards something that involves stability and predictability. The problem, I think, at the moment is that that's been too often interpreted as being the idea that you mustn't let anyone say or do anything. The idea that in some way China will be in more danger or chaos if there's more space for people to use the media or to speak on social media or to you know, spend more time discussing issues such as environmental pollution or whatever it, it might be. In fact, one of the things that has been, uh, I think, clearly shown is that stability can often come with more space for discussion and more space for interaction. And one might hope that in a period of relative Chinese strength compared to the recent past, that particular message might get through more strongly than it has in, in recent years. A lot of ideas, lots of points put forward there. So I'm going to throw it open now to everybody. Anyone with any questions? And there's a microphone over here. Yes, please. Hold on. And do tell us who you are when you ask a question. Will do. Uh, my name's Charlotte, and um, I'm a journalist. And I write about China and the environment. Um, thank you so much for a fascinating talk, firstly. Um, I wanted to pick up on your point about uh, the approach that you took and how you started your selection process with this idea that you wanted to debunk myths. And it occurred to me while you were speaking that China's doing quite a good job of debunking um, myths on, on its own. So, you know, China's now a, a leader in climate change. It's um, you mean in causing climate change or fighting climate change? Well, both, <laughs> funnily enough, um, which is a, a new situation. And it's championing multilateralism in the face of President Trump championing the opposite. Um, so many ideas about China are being challenged. And I wonder what, which of the most stubborn myths about China or most sort of important truths, if you want to look at it the other way, would influence your decision about picking figures from contemporary Chinese culture that might have a big impact on China's future and its engagement with the rest of the world? Um, thanks very much um, for that, that question, Charlotte. Um, well, first of all, I absolutely agree with you that one of the things that is most fascinating about China today is that it sits simultaneously as, let's be frank, along with the United States and India, one of the world's biggest polluters and causes of climate change, but also, of course, very much at the cutting edge of research and development in the technology of dealing with it, particularly in areas like solar power, renewables, and so forth. So let's hope that the one outdoes the other, because then the, the world will no doubt do better as a, uh, as a result of, uh, uh, of that. In terms of myths, I think I would come back to this idea, because I think that it's important both for China as well as for the outside world, of remembering that China has always been a mixture of plural 
influences. In one of my books, uh, Modern China, a very short introduction, which is available at all good bookshops and some <laughs> bad ones as well, uh, as well as uh, online, of course. Um, I did use the phrase, China is a plural noun, and I believe that very, very strongly. Not just in terms of what I've just said, which is the, um, the idea that foreign influences have always been very important in shaping what it means to be Chinese, whether it's Buddhism or Marxism or things in between, but also in terms of understanding that actually China itself is a whole variety of mixtures of cultures, of influences, and of ways of, uh, ways of thinking. Um, we sometimes think, well, I say we sometimes, people sometimes think that there is something natural about a sort of top-down authoritarian culture in China, that, you know, that China is necessarily more collective or more authoritarian than any other society. Um, I think that's entirely misleading. I think one of the reasons that the Chinese Communist Party sometimes clamps down a bit too hard for its own good, frankly, is not because Chinese people are so inclined to follow what everyone says, but because China, China is, a country, is a country that has so many different competing and interesting ideas that sometimes the government gets a bit worried about um, the, the plural, plurality, plurality of ideas that actually exist in, uh, in China. China has authoritarian strands. China has liberal strands. If you think about Confucianism, Confucianism is a course about hierarchy and knowing your place, and that's the part that... Um, someone like Singapore's leader, Lee Kuan Yew, always used to, uh, to talk about. It's also about ideas of personal cultivation, about reflection, and about developing the sense, in other words, the self. In other words, ideas that stand absolutely at the center of a classical liberal idea of what the self is as well. So I think any idea that the political complexion of China can only be defined in one particular term is also a myth that needs to be unpicked very, uh, very strongly. I mean, that's the, the strange thing about China, isn't it? On the one hand, you do have this image of an authoritarian very you know, uh, system and a very robotic people as well who... who I, hate not, I don't... Uh, well, no, I'm, say, I'm saying, you know, there is this But image. there is that idea. On the other there, hand, when you actually go to China, you do actually discover that people are extremely individual. They have their own ways of doing things, they, they have their own ways of thinking, and sometimes it's really difficult to actually make them a cohesive whole. Sure. But um, anyway, uh, another question. Yes. Hi, I'm Sophia. I was born actually on the border between China and Mongolia, and huh? I came to study about six years ago. Now I'm working in London. Um, I was wondering about your thoughts on one-child policy, do you think um, it brought more benefits for the society um, in terms of the development of China or more disadvantages? Because I was the one child and I'm technically Chinese. I'm very sad I couldn't have any brothers and sisters. Yeah. Thank you. Ooh. Deserves a talk all, all of it its deserves own. a talk all <laughs> its own, and I'm not an expert on demographics, but I will say that I think most of the consensus these days is that the one-child policy actually has had some pretty negative effects. In terms of the wider population, it's created demographic trap, which means that China, as I'm sure you know, is likely to get old before it gets rich, is the, the way that some people put it. If things don't change, then actually it's likely that I think, I'm gonna say by the year 2030, something like 20, 25% of the population will be aged over 60. And that means there's a tremendous burden in terms of pensions and welfare and so forth that the younger generation, your generation, is going to, to have to deal with that, that older uh, uh, generation uh, too. When that policy, there's a very good book by, by uh, the journalist Mei Fong about the um, one-child policy. And it points out that a whole variety of assumptions, which existed in the West as well, actually, in the 1970s, turned out, in fact, not to be accurate. They are um, ideas, for instance, that the world was going to run out of food in 15 years' time. There's a guy called Paul Ehrlich who ran a group called uh, ZPG, ZPG, Zero Population Growth, which extrapolated that if things carried on as they did, then there would be no food, I think, by the year 1985 or something like that. What, in fact, of course, happened was that new methods, the Green Revolution happened, new methods of cropping happened, people opened up new territories. People also started, as they got richer and more middle class, to regulate their families naturally. Japan and South Korea actually have very similar 
demographics to China in some ways. I mean, they're getting older fast, not because anyone told them not to have kids, but because of the way in which societies change. Western Europe is doing the same thing. Britain is just about at replacement rate in terms of its population. Germany is well below it. So in that sense, I'm afraid the argument would probably go that as China certainly had become richer and more prosperous, the one-child policy was um, an obstacle rather than a benefit in that sense. Although there are, whether they're benefits or obstacles is another question, but one has to consider demographically certain questions. People, perhaps like yourself, young, professional, well-educated women, in terms of their own personal economic circumstances, can do very well in China these days, partly because they're a relatively restricted category compared to what they might have been under natural growth. Whether that's a plus or a minus, you would have to tell us. But there are also the economic downsides of, uh, of the one-child policy. You have this whole, what you call the inverted pyramid or inverted... The demographics, yep. Yeah. Yep. And Absolutely. that's obviously going to be a serious problem. Yep. Yes, sorry. Front row. What I've never really understood, sorry, my name's um, <clears throat> Louis Brassier, local GP. Mm. Why doesn't China engage more with its diaspora? I mean, having lived in uh, Israel, which is a country where, for instance, the Jewish communities abroad have the right to live in Israel and there's an intimate connection with them, Given that Chinese um, culture is so distinct, mm -hmm. why, for instance, overseas Chinese, if they get a foreign passport, they're obliged to give up their Chinese nationality, why doesn't it engage more with the, the enormous and historic uh, Chinese uh, communities abroad? Thanks for your question. Well, I point out we're sitting in a place called China Exchange, which, of course, is perhaps one of the manifestations of that wider in engagement. Um, I mean, in terms of citizenship laws, you know, you'd have to ask the Chinese government. But in terms of engagement with the diaspora, I'd say one of the big changing stories, and I looked at someone like Wen Lan here who's a member of it, unlike me. In the last 20 years, I think official China and the mainland of China has become ever more interested in actually engaging with the diaspora and bringing them into that wider sense of community. I mean, events that are held both by official and unofficial groups at universities, business groups. I think that there's been a great enthusiasm to bring in Australian Chinese, British Chinese, Chinese Americans into those sorts of interactions. It hasn't all been a bed of roses. I mean, there are lots of questions now about whether too much pressure is being placed on members of that community, particularly if they aren't necessarily Chinese citizens. Should they regard themselves as having that kind of wider shared identity? I think all people who do share identity, and I speak as someone who obviously comes from an Indian background myself, will know that identity is not simply divisible 50-50 zero sum between different types of, uh, of identity. But at the same time, I think it is fair to say that actually there is a growing interest on China's part in terms of interacting with the wider Chinese ethnic community around the world, and that's likely to grow rather than to, to shrink. Wen Lan, what do you think? Well, another big contrast, I think, here. On the one hand, I do feel that the Chinese government is definitely trying to engage more with the diaspora. On the other hand, I find that many of the diaspora, members of the diaspora, don't actually want to engage with the local community. It's rather sad. I mean, I think the, the, mem the, the Chinese faces that I see over here are perhaps a, you know, a, an example of what's good about Chinese students who come out and who really very seriously want to find out what British culture is like, what Britain is all, all about. Mm. But you do have large populations of Chinese students, I'm sure even at Oxford, who just literally to themselves and, and do not want to share, you know, their, their life, their life, their experience. Well, I mean, I have to say that there has been known for Western students to go to Beijing and Shanghai and then spend their entire time also talking That's to other Westerners, true. so, you know, it's not unknown. Um, I think it is certainly one of the important tasks that does need to be pushed forward more to make sure that when you have student communities, business communities, other communities from China coming to Britain and elsewhere, that there is a chance for genuine interaction. I think you're right that the opportunities and forums for that are still a bit limited. Mm. Um, and I'm sure it goes the other way uh, uh, as well. So, you know, it, it's work in progress, for mm. sure. Mm -mm -mm. Good. Another question. Yes, at the front. Thank you, Professor Rana. Um, my name is Jin Zhao Li from Cambridge, Cambridge China Center. So me uh, and my colleague Sophie travel from Cambridge for this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I know you are a great historian, but the, the question is on Chinese e economy. Um, um, you know, we know that China-American trade war has been going on for over five months. Mm. Really, last five, six months, we see 
big changes in the economic atmosphere in China. Right. So a few months ago, people were talking about consumption upgrade, but now more and more people are talking about consumption downgrade mm -hmm. and deleveraging everything. So I'd like to know your thoughts on China economic path for the next few, few years and also China-UK relationships and opportunities. <laughs> Oh, right. So quite a lot to pack into to one answer then. Well, th thank you for, uh, uh, for that. And as a graduate of Cambridge myself, I'm delighted to see some of the uh, old team uh, here, uh, here today. Um, clearly, the change in atmosphere in terms of international trade, more broadly speaking, led, it has to be said, by the United States' change of position in the last year or so, has been, I think, very disturbing. I think there's no doubt in that. And it's not just China on the other end, of course. You know, the Americans are currently having a massive trade dispute with Canada, which is you know, their closest neighbor and ally. And there's also been some pretty bad blood with the European Union, although that seems to have been, uh, how can you put it, um, allayed a little bit for, for the, short, um, the short term. And I think the general consensus that almost everyone would share is that trade wars are good for nobody. You know, China likes to talk a lot about win-win scenarios, but trade wars are essentially lose-lose scenarios for, for everybody. And that includes those who are launching the trade war. I do think China has lost a particular opportunity, though, in the last few months, which it could have picked up. And that was visible in its discussions with the European Union. The policies of the Trump administration are not ones that even are shared by you know, very large numbers of American policymakers. And the discussions between China and the European Union were posited on the possibility that the two, of two sides, the Chinese and the Europeans, could get together to form a sort of united front saying that they would defend the international trading rules. But part of the problem with that, not the whole of it, but part of the problem is that China still does in reality maintain very strong restrictions in terms of foreign investment and the ability of foreigners to do business in China. Much more open than it was 25 years ago, but still extremely closed relative, relative to most European economies and certainly somewhere like the UK or even the US, despite the rhetoric of, of Mr. Trump. So I think because Europe, I think, would have liked to have reached a situation where it could actually negotiate a more even trading relationship with China, and the Chinese government, for its own reasons of wanting domestic economic control, didn't feel able to do that, an opportunity was missed. One of the reasons for that, I think, actually, though, is to do with what, in answering a question, what's likely to happen in the short term. What I think is going to happen in the next five years, and not just me, but I think lots of people, I do think the Chinese government right now is showing all the signals of finally getting to grips with a really quite serious issue that has been hanging around for a long time, and that's local government debt and the effects of the credit boom post-2008. Essentially, as we know, China put a lot of credit into the economy 10 years ago. It resulted in the short term in lots of things that are actually very useful, airports, high-speed rail, Gautier, all these sorts of things, which will no doubt stand China in good stead for quite some time to come. But the problem is that it's pumped up lots of things, including a property boom, you know, all of those um, fangnu mortgage slaves out there who are basically paying for more and more expensive properties in Shanghai and Beijing and places. Their incomes may be going up, but even more of those incomes are being squeezed by the fact that they can't afford to live. I mean, anyone who lives in London will know about this, so it's not just Beijing, but you know, it is a real um, problem. And linked to that is the fact that squeezing all of that debt out of the economy is both going to cause lots of problems. Let's take um, that place, I think, in Hunan, uh, Leang, uh, in the last few weeks, where the local schools are having to close down because, essentially, local governments can no longer afford to pay for the services that were basically being paid for by debt. And again, you know, this is something that has some familiarity in austerity Britain uh, uh, as well. I think that now that they've started, the Chinese government are going to continue to push that squeeze forward for the next few years. But the likelihood is that by doing that, they are not actually going to be able to open the economy up much more because a freely convertible renminbi or expanding the ability of uh, uh, China to basically uh, trade in international markets is not going to be compatible with that very high level of state control of the economy. So for the short term, I think you're right that there's going to be a squeeze on domestic consumption and maybe the chance of getting that second Mercedes or even the first Mercedes or uh, going down to uh, buy that Louis Vuitton handbag or whatever it might be or that extra you know, vacation somewhere in, uh, uh, in, uh, on Hainan Island may have to be put on the back burner for, uh, for a while. And that may cause a certain amount of you know, social dis discontent. These things have, um, have consequences. Um, I assume the idea is that 
China will come out the other end in the early 2020s, having squeezed the economy into a more healthy state. But the journey going there might be quite bumpy. <laughs> Would anyone like to come back to a historical subject? Oh, please. Uh, second row. Uh, Harshad Mystery, a journalist and a good friend of Brain Crichton as well. Um, okay. I was going to say, uh, what, what is um, the history that is currently being taught in China now? Uh, what, are the, what are the big things that, if you're a Chinese child growing up, that they might refer to as something that you must know by the time you learn, by the time you leave at 16 or something. Is there a, a revision going on of, of what might have been, they might have been taught 30, 40 years ago? You mean in terms of history? Yeah, in terms of history. Because I mean, one of the things that Chinese um, school children will get plenty of is lots of maths and uh, English as well, which uh, is no doubt going to be very, very useful in, in global terms. Um, the Chinese historical curriculum is being squeezed quite heavily, particularly on the modern history front. So it, you know, the whole period, particularly after 1949, i.e. after the Communist Revolution, but even after 1911 and the fall of the last emperor, is quite often difficult to teach. I mean, there'll be people in this room who have gone through the Chinese school system, either more or less recently, um, uh, depending what age they are. And while it waxes and wanes a bit, school textbooks have generally been the most closely controlled parts of the system. So there are very large events which generally, and again, I'm very happy to be corrected on this, but generally the textbooks that I've seen will say almost nothing about the Great Leap Forward period of the 1950s and 60s, including no mention of the huge social turmoil, famine, and other things that happened then. And while the Cultural Revolution is mentioned, it's usually in very, very sort of short and brief terms, talking about a period of dreadful turmoil, which is now over. So the question of causes and reasons and the underpinning um, factors that led to the two most traumatic events of that period are not really discussed. And the problem is, of course, that between the Great Leap Forward of the 50s and the Cultural Revolution of the 60s and 70s, that's a very large proportion of the Maoist period in power. So it doesn't leave huge amounts of other stuff to cover. So in the end, that period of history tends to get covered quite thinly. The period before that, the Republican period, which we talked about, is in some senses more interesting because that sort of waxes and wanes as well. There are aspects of that period, including, for instance, the period of the Second World War, which are now being stressed much more than they were before, including the contribution of actors who were not communists during that period. And that has expanded somewhat in the last 20 years or so. But even so, it tends to go back and forward. So it's definitely the case that the overall framework of modern history is taught but it has lots and lots of gaps and holes in it that can really lead to a rather sort of disparate and disconnected view of how modern history has emerged during that period. And many teachers, I suspect, find it much easier just to stop at 1911 and, and leave it there with the fall of the last emperor. But, but isn't that going to be a serious problem for the next generation? You yourself firmly believe that you can only understand China properly if you look back at her history. But it, if the people of China themselves, the younger people, mm. are not taught about those grimmer stories of the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, etc., etc., how can they actually understand anything about their past? Well, you make a, um, a, an assumption, which I hope is true, but it's not guaranteed, Wenlan, that young people in China are interested in the past at all. I have to say that, you know, that they... Fascination well, with history may not be all that, that strong. That, I do that is very true, but um, I think to a certain extent perhaps that's being encouraged, you know, that mm. they should not be looking at recent history, uh, if at all it should mm. be anything pre-1911. I think it's a huge gap. I mean, I will say, I don't think, you know, it's not on the same scale, but just to point out that until recently in this country, in the UK, very little, relatively speaking, was taught about Britain's period of empire. It was very much a kind of islands-based story in which India and other things were kind of off the, the edges, or Africa indeed, and that's only begun to change in recent years. So we are capable even in the liberal world of our own lacunae. But that having been said, yes, I think it's very clear that the inability to teach a full, wide, and debated range of viewpoints about modern history makes it quite restricted. And if you go and talk, as I often do, to professional historians in China, they will quite often find it very frustrating that what they do their specialist research on is very difficult to discuss in a wider context because 
it can't be filtered from the universities. I mean, there is still much more freedom in the academy, in the universities, to discuss many of these topics, but of course, that tends to be stuff that's published in very obscure journals that only other academics will read, or published in English language only outside China. And the chances of that filtering down to the textbooks and television programs and popular histories that people read is much smaller than, uh, than, it, uh, than it might be. Mm. Because you actually mentioned the television program as one mm. of your Chinese characters, uh, He Shang, and that very much questioned our, our past you know, and what the problems that arose therefrom. But that whole questioning seems to be actively discouraged. And surely, for any pop nation to, to actually develop and to mature, they must look back at their own history, good or bad. Well, as a professional historian, I would like to believe that uh, history is very central to countries and societies and people's understanding themselves, so I'd certainly agree with that. Um, I think, though, that there is, if we're talking about what's actually happening now, there is not much chance of the situation changing any time soon. It's clear that there is very strong, powerful control over the interpretation of history. It has been getting stronger rather than weaker in recent years. And there is no reason that I can see to believe that that's going to change any time soon. So I agree with you in principle, absolutely. The more and the wider history we can have, the better. But all the science that we have, not just in schools, but elsewhere, for instance, the fact that Chinese historical archives are much harder for researchers to get into than they were five or 10 years ago, for Chinese scholars, as well as for foreign scholars, I should say, is a sign of the way in which much of discussion about the historical past is really being restricted. And unfortunately, at least at the moment, China does seem to be going through that, straight, that stage of being more restricted rather than less restricted on that front. And yes, it is absolutely a deprivation and, uh, and a lack in which China's own understanding of history suffers far more than, than the West does. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, could you please join me in thanking Professor Hong?